uh, title of the talk is Formal Linguistics and the Experimental Turn. And uh, the organizers uh, kindly asked me to start with something like a, a two slides about why I do science, and why I do linguistics and stuff like that. And I, I'm not very, uh, really good uh, in these uh, general talks and I don't want to talk to you about uh, whether I ra uh, read Gilles Verne. I read yeah, stuff like that. Uh, it's easily imaginable. So I, I will talk about more general principles which I, I think are common and maybe more interesting to you because you probably as a PhD students share them with me. Uh, and I will just present my perspective on that. So why I think that's, it's good to do science and to do linguistics because that's that part of science I'm doing. Uh, I think it, if, you, if, you, if you look at the things people uh, do from ancient times, uh, there is certain direction in, in, in thinking and it's definitely not only uh, uh, a kingdom of uh, science, and uh, this, this, let's say, this is some uh, some sort of fascination with hidden principles behind the reality, and you can you can uh, go this way uh, in many different uh, subpaths. Let's say you can go with Plato and talk about ideas, and you can go with mathematicians and talk about uh, sets and uh, 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 abstract uh, objects which don't exist in space and time, and uh, uh, if you are in 20th century, you can you can uh, make programs and uh, you can code programs. And in fact, for me, this is maybe the most useful uh, metaphor of this because uh, when I was writing this uh, uh, these slides, what I did was I wrote this uh, source code, and from this source code, this slide is made. Yeah, and this is exactly what people in science do. So I don't care about whether it's blue or not. I don't care whether Moimi Duchika should be in the half of the page or not. I say, okay, the title of my talk is this, and the program makes a, uh, makes a slide from that. Yeah. And I include some libraries because I need trees and stuff like that you will see later. And I do coding. And behind the slides, there is some source code. And behind the reality, there is something hidden. And uh, you can go maybe directions which are not that uh, uh, common and probably even misleading like conspiracy theories, but all these things have something like a common denominator. It is fascination with something which is hidden behind the reality and that is science and this is why I started this and uh, I think it's pretty much common uh, way of looking at the world if you do philosophy or if you do science, it's some sort of fascination with the world. So I would say, okay, science is maybe now the only controlled way how to understand at least some parts of these engines which are behind the reality. And uh, this is very close to what uh, Noam Chomsky, maybe you know this name at least from the political context, but he's uh, the number one in linguistics still, even if he's retired already from MIT. And he's in his recent article uh, said it much better and nicer than me, of course, so I will cite him. And he says, okay, the whole goal of science is to replace complex visibles by simple invisibles. That is science. If you are not doing that, then it's something else. It is data organization, flower collection, sometimes the latter is useful, but it shouldn't be confused with science. If it's science, since Galileo, it's an effort to satisfy uh, Galileo's maxim nature is simple. If we have not figured it out, it's our problem. So that's it. Uh, so that's something like a, a, a reason why I like science. We are trying to find the complex, the simple invisibles behind the complex visibles. And I will use this metaphor during my talk uh, on more uh, uh, data-oriented examples. That's pretty abstract now. And the second thing I like on science, and in fact is uh, uh, why I'm standing now here, is that you have to cooperate. You have to cooperate with people. And I don't know, you have... Uh, different backgrounds than me, but in humanities, this is this is not so still still not so uh, common. In natural sciences, I think it's it's norm today, but in in humanities, it's not. But these are people who I work with this last couple of years and who taught me what I'm doing now. And these are people with Czech names, and uh, they are Czechs. But uh, Ivona uh, has PhD from MIT, Jakub has PhD from Amsterdam, and these people are on the universities around the world, and there are other colleagues which I work with. And this is the second part of science I really like. You work with people because you cannot do it your, on your own. No matter how 
intelligent how good you are, you cannot do it. So that's these two slides. I somehow wanted to present at the beginning why I bring internet, what is so interesting for me in science. And now to the real linguistic part. And yeah, please, uh, now we are going to the, to the normal lecture, uh, uh, lecture stuff. Feel free to interrupt me in any time because I don't have a clue about your background, about what uh, you understand or not. So I would be more than happy to get feedback immediately, okay? So what I will present now is first I will talk about formal linguistics. Uh, I assume everybody here knows something about linguistics and maybe heard names like Saussure and, and uh, uh, this generation of linguists, maybe heard about Chomsky, but I assume that formal linguistics is not so well known, so I will, uh, I will give you one of some examples what formal linguistics is. Then I will talk about uh, something which is a bit new, this is 30 years uh, uh, or uh, old uh, thing which happened in linguistic and I call it experimental turn as many do and I'm very happy to be part of that experimental turn. Uh, then I will present uh, something like a case study of uh, what I did with my colleagues which is called neck raising. Uh, I will explain you of course what, what it is and uh, this will be sort of a linguistic experiment we run and on this case study I will show you what really does it mean to do uh, experimental linguistics and how it somehow is connected back to the formal linguistics and uh, this is the last part so how you debug experiments how you work with them and, uh, and stuff like that okay so first formal linguistics uh, it's easy to say and I think it's to 99% uh, true that uh, formal linguistics started in 50 years ago or 60 years uh, now ago with Chomsky uh, book Syntactic Structures. And what Chomsky says in, this, in, the, in the book is that uh, when you look at language, what you as a linguist are supposed to do is to find the procedure to, to tease apart grammatic sentences from the grammatic sentences. And we use in linguistic uh, some sort of marking, so English sentence like 1A, John's mother loved herself, is a perfect uh, grammatical English sentence, but 1B, John's, uh, John's loves herself mother, is probably ungrammatical. Uh, and one C is something behind, uh, be between these two extremes, herself loves John's mother, maybe is possible, but very, very hard to understand, so that's why there are C question marks. So what Chomsky said is, okay, uh, how are you doing linguistics upon you, but you have to uh, come with a procedure which uh, tells you, okay, in English this sentence is grammatical, this is not. Which is exactly what people do in logic or in formal languages when they construct these formal grammars and stuff like that. And uh, the way we do it in linguistics is that we postulate something we call formal rules. And uh, I will give you an example of the formal rule. I don't have time to really go through formal grammars, but let me give you an example. So. Uh, there will be example of a rule which uh, touches anaphors. Anaphors are uh, uh, words like English himself, herself and uh, stuff like that. So for English speakers something like John loves himself, uh, unlike what, to be John loves herself is a grammatical sentence. So you have something like, let's go back to the Chomsky's complex visibles, you have something like complex visibles, okay, so people will say, okay, this sentence is okay, this sentence is ungrammatical. And then people have intuitions about meanings. So if I say somebody, John thinks that Paul loves himself, the only way people understand this is that himself uh, Corefers, this technical term, uh, has the same meaning as Paul. It cannot mean that John thinks that Paul loves John. That's why I use these uh, subscripts and I have this star here which is used to mark the ungrammatical sentence. So it's not possible to understand this sentence as if the himself would mean the same as John, but it, the only possible way to interpret it is to uh, interpret it as coreferent with Paul. So that's the second part of complex visible you have. People have intuitions about meaning. So people categorize some sentences as grammatical and ungrammatical, and people have some intuitions about what the sentence means. And this the stuff with, with the, the bread and butter with linguist starts with. And that's why maybe experiments came a bit late in linguistics and in formal linguistics, because everybody has intuitions about her own language. So people in linguistics started to do formal linguistics and started with intuitions about their own language. It was easy. 
uh, yeah. And now, what are the structures in linguistics? So again, I will be totally on surface, but I hope still the metaphor will uh, work. So what linguists say uh, nowadays in formal linguistics is that the, the structure of sentences is not really different from the structure of mathematical arithmetic computation. So totally simplistic example, uh, when you do this uh, arithmetic calculation, you know that the result is 11. You first multiply 4 by 2, uh, the result is 8, and then you add 3 and the result is 11. And exactly this kind of trees we do in linguistics. They just have different labels. So. Uh, I have a sentence like here, John's father lied himself, and I draw a tree. This is exactly what students in the first year when they come to linguistics learn. They, they, they learn to draw these trees. Uh, and this is the structure behind the sentences anybody in linguistics believe. Uh, so this sentence says, okay, there is a verb, laughs, there is a subject, uh, which is because the head of this subject is noun. It's called noun phrase. and and the uh, object is here. So this is subject, this is verb, this is object, and there is some structure uh, behind that uh, linearization of the sentence. And Chomsky in his book 1981, uh, based on many work on anaphora, claimed, okay, when we go back to these anaphors, so words like himself and herself, he claimed, okay, they are grammatical if they are in the scope of uh, their antecedent. Antecedent, like in logic, is the uh, thing uh, from which the anaphor gets the uh, reference, the meaning. So let me remind you, I assume something like a basic knowledge of logic. So this is, this is a predicate logic formula, and uh, this quantifier, this existential quantifier, binds this uh, variable x. So this and here and here, the variable is bound, but here is Free. So the formula is uh, non null form or open formula. So here the formula, uh, the, the, the x is bound and here is free. And that's exactly what we, uh, so this, this idea of scope, this quantifier has scope over these two, but not over this. So this is exactly what we, uh, what we do in linguistic on trees. So Chomsky said, okay, anaphors are grammatical if they are in the scope of their antecedent. So father is uh, head of this known phrase, so it can, be, uh, it can be antecedent of this anaphor. It can mean that John's father loves himself, the father. But it cannot mean that John's father loves John, because this is only modifier, it is not head of this phrase, and because of that, this doesn't see command, the, it, uh, the, the scope of this is not the VP, and this cannot be antecedent of this, uh, of this uh, Mm, anaphor. Um, okay, let's maybe zoom out. So what, what, we, what we do in linguistics is we pose some structures and we say there are some rules which are connected to the structures. And it's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the basic idea. Uh, let me, uh, we can skip this, this is too much. Uh, complicated maybe, and if you look at something like uh, uh, current introduction to syntax, like Carney 2006, it's usually f from 500 pages to 1,000 pages old textbooks, which is normal in uh, any field. Uh, so after 50 years, after Chomsky, there is something like uh, 10 pages of bibliography, what people uh, wrote uh, on the basic level about these rules. So it really generated waste agenda. It really was very successful in terms of heuristics and stuff like that. So uh, it was a good start from a syntax, what Chomsky uh, uh, did. But I'm, what, what I do and uh, what uh, formal uh, uh, experimental stuff is more close to is another part of uh, formal linguistics, which is which is called formal semantics, and it's still younger than the uh, formal syntax which I presented now. And that is uh, formal semantics. The formal semantics is uh, uh, devoted to natural language meanings. It, uh, even more than the formal syntax uses math logical and mathematical tools, and it started with, uh, with uh, 
couple of articles by Richard Montague, who wasn't linguist at all, he was a logic, uh, logician and mathematician, and he said uh, in his article that uh, he rejects the contention uh, that an important theoretical difference exists between formal and natural languages. So according to Montague, between Czech and Python or Czech and uh, predicate logic, there is no real difference. So he really started to try to rewrite uh, natural logic into some sort of uh, uh, English into some sort of uh, uh, logical formulas. And even if we know now that this is really, really big simplification, it was a good heuristic start of a program. And I will show you again on some examples how uh, these things uh, <coughs> work. I, I, again, I cannot kind of go with you through, uh, through the whole framework, but uh, again, the, my idea was to present some examples and I hope that you will get at least a glimpse of that. So uh, again, let's look at examples from natural language. So uh, one of the phenomena, one of the central phenomena of natural language is coordination. So all natural languages have some sort of coordination like English and. And you can coordinate a lot of things together. You can coordinate uh, nouns. So you can say John met Mary and Sue. And you can coordinate what we uh, 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 call prepositional phrases because, in fact, uh, what you coordinate is something which starts with preposition. John sits in the park and under the tree. So what you coordinate are two prepositional phrases. <coughs> but when you stra start to coordinate things uh, like entity denoting uh, expression Mary and uh, PP, John met Mary and under the tree, the, uh, the result is ungrammatical. And, uh, you don't know why, and people in semantics claim this is because uh, the, uh, the phrases which you coordinate must be of the same semantic type. So uh, here are some logical types. So E means that the phrase denotes entity. So A would be uh, corresponding to 10, uh, 10 A. So John met Mary and Sue, this E would be Mary, and this E would be Sue. This is uh, something which goes as an input tip type into the computation, and the output type is again entity. It's plural entity. You can you have to use some uh, something more expressive than uh, predicate logic for uh, uh, so from 80s uh, there, uh, there start to be, to be uh, some uh, some frameworks which uh, incorporate this. But 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 basic logical type is entity. So this whole coordination is of entity. And when you coordinate this, what you coordinate is let's say set, now this is the set of points in space, set of points in the space, and set of points in the space. So it's a set of things, set of things, the t is uh, truth value, to, so this is the function from uh, entities to truth values, or you can imagine it's at a set that's, that's easier. And what you, what you obtain is a set of, uh, set of points, uh, in this case, the intersection of these two sets. And uh, the, general, uh, the general form then is something like this. You combine two types of uh, any alpha type, and you uh, get back uh, the alpha as the result of the coordination. And that's why 10C is bad, because Mary is of type entity, and under the tree is set of points, and you cannot coordinate E and ET. You have to use two. Uh, uh, types of the same, two logical times of the same type. That's, that's the explanation of why this is bad. And this type compatibility, which goes back to work of uh, Gottlob Frege and uh, logicians, uh, uh, analytic philosophers, uh, uh, is, is really something like uh, uh, syntactic, uh, uh, syntactic, um, Verification whether the types uh, which goes into the computation are of the right, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, whether they, they, they can be combined. So let me show you on an example. So Peter is a student, is a sentence which, according to Frege, has a meaning uh, truth value. So true, false, one, zero, however you call it. And, uh, the whole sentence is composed uh, uh, of uh, predicate, which is of the type of set, 
to be a student, this is a set of students, and Peter, which is composed of the type E, so NTT. And these things together, you, you, you combine this ET and E type, and you obtain the T type, and everything is okay. <coughs> if you have something more interesting, like every student sleeps, what you do is you have two sets, set of students and a set of things which sleeps, and every is sort of glue, which takes two sets, I was too lazy to put brackets here, but this is the first set and this is the second set. So first you combine this with this set, you obtain things, this is a set of sets, uh, which has a set of students as a subset, and then you combine this with this set, and uh, of course uh, this quantifier uh, would uh, give you a true sentence if this set is subset of this set. Yeah. But if you would put uh, here uh, some student, uh, the, 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 um, the combination wouldn't be subset, but, uh, uh, but intersection, if you would uh, put there two students, uh, it would be the same, but the intersection would have the cardinality of two and, and so on and so on, it's easily imaginable. But the basic idea, again, like in the formal syntax is you have structures and then you have rules for combinations. And here the rule of combination is really basic. It's really frege. It's really functional application. You've got a function, you've got argument, and the function must be of the right type to combine with the argument. That's all. And sometimes you try to combine things which don't go together. So <clears throat> if you have sentence like 13, Peter is every student, the sentence is ungrammatical. But that sentence is not uh, ungrammatical because it would be syntactically bad form or non well form because every is a determiner like a uh, and Peter is a student or Peter is this student this perfect fine English sentence so the result uh, the ungrammaticality of the sentence is not syntactically non well formedness but it is because of the types because Peter is the, of type E it's entity and every student as was clear from this, needs two sets, but you give to every student only one entity, and that's a problem. You cannot combine this and this. this I, I don't know, it's something like uh, try to combine uh, uh, well, there is a type clash between these two. two I, I, don't, I don't have a nice uh, metaphor now in my, in my mind. So that's the, that's the example of a semantic, a semantic rule or which uh, results from the type clash. So you see something like uh, different types of explanation, but uh, somehow the spirit remains the same. Uh, we have rules and we have structure, and the structure in formal semantics somehow is very uh, close to what formal sem syntacticians do. But in formal semantics, uh, we pay more attention to the meaning. That's, that's the, uh, the take-home message from this part. Uh, let's skip ambiguities and now go to the experimental semantics or experimental linguistics. So let's say that for 30, 40 years from the beginning of Chomsky uh, syntactic structures, the linguistics, formal linguistics really was growing. And it produced a lot of nice explanations, first about English, of course, but then about many, many other languages. In the 80s, uh, people really started to look at all types of natural languages and uh, really try to uh, extend the uh, agenda to, to typologically more interesting languages than, than English, because English is somehow uh, strange typologically. And uh, there started to appear something which, to some extent, is a trap of formal linguistic. Because people start to search for generalization um, with, let's say, too narrow the da data domain. I will show you an example of what it means in, in, in two slides. But uh, it's really tempting to try to find generalization like this and say, OK, maybe this sentence is ungrammatical because there is a type clash. But you don't know it. You don't know in advance when you are linguist whether people don't like the sentence because they have bad 
types or because uh, there is some syntactic process uh, which uh, like agreement which didn't proceed or God knows what if you are looking at a language you don't know. And that can be a trap of formal linguistics and maybe one of the reasons why people started to do experimental stuff in, in linguistics which I think it's maybe the other way around in, in uh, other sciences. But as I said at the beginning, uh, because linguistic is strange in the sense that we all have first person access to our native language, it's easy to come with examples and with intuitions. You don't have to gather data like in, I don't know, biology uh, or physics because you have them in your mind. Yeah. But that can be a bit uh, trap, yeah. So in the late 80s and uh, early 90s, uh, there started to be a movement in, in, in a formal linguistic, which is called now experimental term. And generally, <coughs> the, uh, what happened is that people started to pay more attention uh, to empiry. So people started to do experiments with, with uh, representative uh, number of speakers, they started to look uh, at more nuanced data, and there is a recent uh, textbook uh, from Bayern, which is, uh, the name is Analyzing Linguistic Data, a Practical Introduction to Statistic Using R, because at least in my field, people are not uh, learning statistics without learning some programming. So R is a programming language which goes well together with statistics. And when you go through this book, you have a, a lot of case studies like dative alternation in English, frequencies and relative frequencies of English words, frequency distribution of Dutch prefixes and stuff like that. Uh, and, but I will not present this. I will present my own experiment because it's easier for me and I have more to say about that. And again, uh, when you look at the bi bibliography in 2008, so 20 years after the experimental term uh, appeared, it is something like five pages of experimental work. And when you go today to uh, nice conferences like Zinun Bedeutung on a Linguistic Society of America, one third or one half of the program is experimental. So after 20 years, uh, this uh, approach started to be really, really taken seriously in, in linguistics. Uh, and now I will show you on a case study uh, how such experiment uh, looks like, how it somehow is connected to the formal linguistics, how the, let's say, deductive part of the formal linguistic is connected to the experimental stuff, how, how data are gathered, how the, they are processed and so on. But before that I have to uh, quickly talk, and this will be more of the humanities-like talk, uh, talk about what is negrazing, because the experiment was about negrazing. So, the negrazing is ability of some predicates to interpret their negation on embedded predicate. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it was spotted already by St. Anselm, so the history of this uh, phenomenon, not this term, goes back to scholastics. And uh, he has some debate about necessity of celibate. I, I cannot read this sentence because the last time I, I had Latin was 20 years ago. But let's look at the, at, the, uh, at the structural properties of the sentence. So here you have negation, here you have a modal verb, something like English should, and here you have the lexical verb, sin. And uh, negation clearly uh, targets the modal verb, but it's not the reading you get. So nobody understands this sentence like it, uh, it's not necessary for you to sin, which you would expect because the negation is here. And that's what St. Anselm, Anselm uh, spotted. So he had nice intuitions, philosophers usually have nice intuitions about language. And he says, okay, it's like the negation is interpreted here, like if it would live here. So it says that you should not sin. The negation is taking scope over the, over the uh, lexical verb. And that's why today it's called negrazing. It's not the name St. Anselm uh, coined. It's a 40 years old name. Because in generative grammar, in, in the formal syntax, uh, it was popular to believe that the negation really started here, 
and somehow, because the structure would be uh, uh, the structure would be something like here, then you add the uh, modal verb, and what you do is you raise your negation somewhere here, and you pronounce it here. That is why it's called negrasic. Nobody believes that now, but the uh, descriptive term uh, remained. And people, uh, philosophers, uh, <coughs> noticed uh, that, so this is from Hintika, that famous uh, Finnish philosopher, and he says, agent doesn't believe that P, which P is some proposition, has peculiarity in that it is often used as if it were equivalent to agent A believes that non P, which is exactly what Elmsham said about uh, 15. And similarly, you can find this uh, in uh, Quine's uh, What an Object MOOC. And grammarians noted it uh, before philosophers. Grammarians sometimes are faster than philosophers. So here are some examples from uh, Jespersen and Martinon. I don't know about your native languages. Maybe uh, you recognize some of them. So for instance, here in German, you find uh, negation in the, we linguists call it root sentence. So the sentence which is, uh, I, um, embedding sentence and, and uh, the meaning is that the uh, nicht is interpreted on this, uh, on this uh, embedded verb. Uh, the same for French here and again some English example. So schematically what uh, happens with negrazing uh, in terms of semantics is that you have negation on some embedding predicate, let's call it negrazing predicate, then you have some predicate uh, embedded in this. So think is this predicate, this negrazing, P is this come, but you interpret it sine qua non as the, the negation targets a scope over the embedded predicate. So if somebody says, I don't think he has come, what he most, in most contexts mean is that he thinks that he hasn't come. Compare this with examples where these things don't happen. So if Carol didn't say that Peter left, you don't uh, imply that uh, Karel said that Peter didn't leave. Maybe Karel was, Karel was totally silent about uh, Peter. And the same was uh, the same with certain. If Karel isn't certain that Peter left, it's for sure not true that Karel is certain that Peter didn't leave. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't imply that Karel is certain that Peter uh, didn't leave. So these are 20 are no, so-called non-negrazing predicates. And linguists, at least since Horn, tried to isolate these negrazing predicates. And they recognize at least five classes of negrazing predicates, predicates of intention, obligation, perception, opinion, and probability, and against them stand non-negrazing predicates, which are usually verbs of communication or verbs of causation, so force, cause, promise, and so on. So with these predicates, if you negate them, you usually mean that the negation uh, copes over the embedded predicate with this never. And now to the experiment one. So that's something like a background of what negrazing is. And uh, now because I'm speaker of Czech, I live here and uh, I have direct touch with uh, students who are perfect uh, subjects for the experiments. So I, of course, work on Slavic languages. And when you look at negrazing uh, in uh, current linguistics, it generally is a very popular topic. So for instance, this, Jon Gajewski, it's a MIT PhD thesis from 2005. This Vincent Homer, I think this 2011 is uh, University of uh, Southern California, I think a PhD thesis from 2011, but of course that's all about English. Homer touches something from French, but it's about English. So it's very popular, but in the central linguistics. And when you look at Slavic languages, it's, it's, there, is, there was only one article uh, co-authorized by this Jon Gajewski, a really smart guy in semantics, and Želko Boškovic, one of the big names in uh, uh, current uh, formal syntax. And they claim 
that Slavic languages are strange because they don't have anything like neck raising. There is nothing like neck raising in Slavic languages. And it nicely fits with what Boshkovich claims about Slavic languages that they uh, are very, very different from, uh, from uh, uh, Germanic languages. And uh, this is one of these traps I said at the beginning. Uh, can appear in formal, formal linguistics because you want to search for nice invisibles behind the chaos of complex visibles and sometimes you are maybe misled by, uh, by data or by your interest or whatever. Uh, but uh, why they claim this? I, I will show you the data. Um, so, uh, of course, this uh, what, 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 what was here were just intuition. So, St. Anselm said something about the intuitions we have. But in linguistics, we usually try to come with some tests about uh, the intuitions. And there is a strange class of expression in all languages uh, in the world, which are called negative polarity items, uh, the, the abbreviation NPI, negative polarity item. And there is a subclass of these negative polarity items, which are strict negative polarity items. These are things like English, <coughs> English until midnight. They are strange because <coughs> they can appear in negated sentence, and the negation must be really in the in the in the in the sentence when this where these strict NPIs appear. So these strict NPIs are sort of lacmus paper. Uh, which tests whether uh, there is really negation in the sentence. And this paradigm uh, shows you why these strict NPIs are important for the neck raising debate. So if you say in English something like, John doesn't believe that Mary arrived until midnight, that sentence is perfectly uh, acceptable. And it means something like, John believes that Mary didn't arrive until midnight. So you understand it this way, and because you understand it this way, you have the negation here, the strict NPI until midnight is grammatical. But if you say something like, John doesn't say that Mary arrived until midnight, this sentence is uh, pretty weird for English speakers. What, what changed is that uh, this negraiser predicate uh, was substituted with uh, communication verb, which is not negraiser. So the negation stays here, and because it is too far away from the strict NPI, the sentence becomes ungrammatical. So people use this strict NPI as a sort of run-of-the-mill test for the existence of negrazing, for, for the real presence of negation somewhere down. Because if there is strict NPI here, and the negation really uh, appears here in the structure, then all should be okay. But if you take non-negrazing verb, then uh, uh, the sentence becomes ungrammatical like here. So that's, that's, that's something like a general test used by Gajewski, Homer, everybody in the field. And uh, Boschkovic and Gajewski uh, used this test <coughs> on some Slavic languages, and uh, they come with uh, these uh, example sentences from Polish, Serbo-Croatian, Bulgarian, Czech, Slovenian, Russian, and, and so on and so on. Maybe some of you are speakers of some of these languages. And at least for me, I would agree with them that something like 22e e in Czech, Jan nevěří, že Marie ji navštívila nejméně dva roky, which is strict NPI, is pretty weird sentence in Czech. And these stars for Boškovic and Gajewski are sort of empirical argument for claiming, okay, there is nothing like neck raising in Slavic languages. Because if there would be neck raising, you would expect these sentences to be okay. Again, let me repeat the argument. So there is a neck raising verb, there is a negation. Uh, let me show it on, on, on check. There is a neck raising verb, a belief type, there is a negation, <clears throat> there is a strict NPI. And if there would be neck raising, you would expect this sentence to be grammatical, but it is not. So, uh, so uh, it follows from this uh, that for Boschkovic and Kajewski that uh, there is no neck raising. And they related it to absence of articles in, in Slavic languages and to many other properties, and they have nice theoretical story about that. But that story is, is, is not true, and yeah, that, that, that's a problem. And I had some problems with these examples because, as I will show you, there are some complications. Even if I agree with them that this sentence is bad, 
That doesn't mean that you cannot find sentence which is first negrazing in Czech, and second, if you modify the sentence somehow, and I will show you how, <coughs> the negrazing will start uh, to work. And uh, because this is talk about experiments, and I am doing experiments for a couple of years, uh, we designed an uh, experiment with, uh, with Jakub Dutlachil, that was uh, one of these photos at the beginning. Uh, so let me now talk about experiment. Now it will be about design of the experiment, how the experiment is done in linguistics. And uh, again, I assume that if you are from natural sciences, this, this can be uh, uh, something like uh, uh, not trivial, but in humanities, this is still new. So uh, we, we designed this experiment in two parts. First, there was an acceptability judgment task. <coughs> and in, I will talk about this first. So in the acceptability task, participants had to judge the acceptability of sentences with strict NPIs, which in Czech are ani jeden, not even one in English, and až do, until, using five-point uh, Likert scale. Uh, five was best, one was worse, so exactly the opposite as in basic school. And the question was whether NPIs, strict NPIs can be licensed. <coughs> Let me show you an example. So this was one of the items we used in five conditions. First, we uh, looked at a sentence where there is a positive uh, verb, so no negation, and strict NPIs. Strict NPI, one strict NPI. So something like, any sheep uh, was missing in English, if I would be. Any is a weak NPI, but closest the meaning to what we tested. So this we expected to be totally unacceptable for people. So that was one, one end of the range we were interested in. Then we tested basic negative sentence. So something like uh, not a single sheep is missing, so here is a negation on verb, here is a strict NPI, and it's one sentence. Again, this should be totally acceptable to all Czech speakers. That's the second end point of the range, uh, which was in, in interesting for us. And now comes the two sentences which were really what we searched for. So here is a negrazing verb, chtít, want. Here is a strict NPI in the embedded sentence. And we ask people on the Likert scale how much they like the sentence. And this is the uh, want type of negrazer, this is the think type of negrazer, and we tested, uh, we tested communication verb to see whether there will be difference between non-negrazers and negrazers. So generally we have five, it's sold called conditions, positive sentence, A, negative sentence, B, <coughs> and a close embedded under the negated uh, negrazing predicates. There were two types, uh, intention judgment and uh, opinion, which was the condition D, and then there was also this non-negrazing predicates like communication verb. There were two types of strict NPIs, anieden and until. Here are our, uh, examples of words we used. Uh, here are, yeah, we, uh, one of the things which uh, people in linguistics did before the experiments uh, started to uh, be somehow serious, that they, they constructed sentences like, John believes that Mary is gone, and it's hard for people to uh, imagine context where such sentences would be true. So we use something like uh, small scenario sentences. So we use sentences about librarians and books, writers of detective novels and journalists, and doctors and patients and stuff like that. So, it will, so, so, so to really help the subjects, imagine what the sentences are talking about. Compare this with, with, with what uh, Boshkovich and Kajewski uh, tried. Jan, Marie, visit. Yeah. Uh, the, so that, that was the first part. So we looked at really that was the that was the acceptability part. Then we asked people about their intuitions. So that was the second part. And we asked people about the negrazing intuition. So the, the task was something like, if you believe that John doesn't think that it's raining, would you believe that John thinks that it's not raining? Which is exactly the negrazing inference. And then we ask about something which is called cyclic neg negrazing, which is again quite a uh, normal test in the standard formal literature. So 
uh, you have something like a stacking of negrazers. So if I don't believe Bill wanted Harry to die, I maybe should believe that Bill wanted Harry not to die, which is st stuck of one negrazer belief and want on top of each other. And if all goes uh, well, you should get uh, uh, the uh, negrazing inference. And the third uh, intuition we asked about was uh, whether people uh, get something like, uh, if you believe that not every student thinks that Mary passed, that you would believe that there are students who think that Mary didn't pass. So again, uh, something like a, a low scope of negation. From the propositional logic, you would get only the scope of negation here, not, uh, not, not here. Yeah. No, no, here, here. Not, not, not here. Uh, and uh, so there was something like a 40 experimental items in the acceptability part and 20 experimental items in the inference part. Uh, so in some there were 60 sentence types. In five envir environments, so this positive, negative, negrazing one, negrazing two, non-negrazing web, and three conditions in the second part of the experiment, uh, which were these uh, uh, negrazing, uh, cyclic negrazing, and uh, existential wide scope. Uh, each part had 30 fillers uh, because in the best experiment, uh, subjects don't know what you are asking them about. There were 60 Czech native speakers. Uh, all of them passed the, uh, the, passed the fillers. So fillers were either grammatical or ungrammatical sentences, for instance, in the first part, but totally unrelated to negrazing. And uh, some logical inferences in the second part, again, totally unrelated to negrazing. And it took uh, people around one hour. It was quite long. It was run online on IBEX. Uh, you can have a look at, uh, OK. For this case, I, I, I put it into slides because I wasn't sure about the connection. So I, I will show you just, just the uh, stills of the IBEX. So it was run on IBEX farm, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, online platform for doing uh, uh, linguistics experiments, I think it's, uh, it's in, uh, on some university on, on East Coast. In America, I mean, it's, it's too small for you, but now there is something like uh, 7,875 experiments around there. So it's uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of current linguistic experiments are around there. Uh, the Dybex farm is a nice software. You have to code the experiment in JavaScript, but it's easy. It measures reaction times of, of uh, subjects, and uh, you can use uh, something like self-paced experiments, uh, self-paced reading, and, and, and uh, stuff like that. So the participants uh, <clears throat> logged into, into this IBEX farm, and they have been presented with these sentences. I, I was cannot show you how the, uh, I, I didn't make. Uh, I didn't make the, uh, the, the snapshot of the page, but uh, uh, they were presented with this Latin square design. Always with uh, there was something okay. There was something like uh, twenty, uh, yeah, twenty items of this Anieden and PI type. So I presented you the sheep example. Then there was. Uh, something like this, this new chief of department, and he doesn't allow uh, students to miss even one lecture, this type of uh, item, and uh, about architects and uh, new buildings and uh, similar examples. And uh, each subject, uh, uh, this is run by IBEX, uh, received randomly one of the conditions from each item. And uh, there was a, a randomized filters uh, uh, put into, so each subject received one condition from each item and between them the, the fillers. Uh, then what you obtain from IBEX is some uh, results in, uh, 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 which look like this. So here you, this is already cleaned up, yeah, it's, uh, because from IBEX you have um, very much information you don't need about uh, browser they used and about uh, IP address they used and stuff like that. When you clean it, uh, you have something like a linguistically relevant uh, 
uh, results. So for this 60 subject, we had something like 3,600 rows of, of uh, answers. So for instance, here is the subject 11 uh, in item number 52. He, on the Likert scale, answered four, so the sentence was grammatical, nearly totally grammatical for him, and uh, answer time in milliseconds was 5,000 uh, milliseconds, 773, and these are some subclassification which we, which we use. So there's a lot of data. You cannot, or at least uh, I'm not able to, uh, to com compute this in, uh, in normal, uh, Excel or uh, iOS LibreOffice. So we used uh, this R Studio. If you work with R, it's a, it's a nice ID uh, which uh, helps you to do statistics. Uh, and I will not uh, be totally specific about the details, but the results. First, the results. What you what you get. This is maybe interesting. Uh, what you get from the from the from the experiment is something like this. So. This is the Likert scale. So this is the worst. This is the one on Likert scale, so totally unacceptable. This is the five on Likert scale, so totally acceptable. And these are the conditions. So condition A was a positive sentence with strict NPI. So this brick, red brick color, and you see really, so this is the number of counts. So there were 60 speakers, 60, 60 subjects, multiplied by the number of items, so we have something like 270 counts of that positive sentence with strict NPI to be uh, perceived as totally unacceptable. But for some people it was at least a bit acceptable, for some it was in the middle, and you see the line here. The condition B, that was the negative sentence with the, uh, with the a strict NPI, so that should be totally acceptable, is this, so this, 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 this greed. So, of course, for the majority of, uh, of subject, uh, it uh, was classified as totally acceptable, but again, there were some people uh, who classified it a, a, a bit less uh, nice than the majority. And here goes the uh, neg raising predicates, so condition C and condition D. And you see they are somehow spread it across the, uh, across the whole Likert scale. And of course you can do uh, mean computation from that. <coughs> but that still is, uh, so the result would be something like, uh, yeah, for condition B, the mean would be around 4.5, the condition uh, C, one neck razor would be around 3.2 and stuff like that. Yeah. So from this, it's hard to tell uh, uh, what's going on. And uh, then the statistics part uh, starts. So we model this uh, with linear models. Uh, it's uh, with some uh, ordered probit regression. And we, so basically we took the condition C which was the neck raising as the reference level. And we asked, the, 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 the statistic question was uh, whether the neck raisers were perceived much worse or much better than the other conditions. So condition B, let me remind you, was this uh, simple negated sentences uh, with uh, strict NPI. And of course, they were judged better than neck raisers. So this is what the, 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 the negative was, was reference level and negated sentences. Uh, so this beta tells you on the Likert scale how much better it was against the conditions against the negators. So in, in, in prose, uh, simple negated sentences, of course, are for people better than the negrazing predicates with strict NPI. But when you look at positive sentences, so condition A, they were still judged as much worse than neck raisers. And the difference was uh, pretty strong. The effect was beyond the statistical significance totally. Yeah? So what, what, you, what you see from this data is, uh, when we go back, this, of course, is best for people. But this is much, much better than this. 
That's what the, that's what the computation tells you. And uh, what is even more important for the linguistic part of, of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of the experiment is when you look at negrazers, so verbs like want, they are still much better than uh, communication verbs or non negrazers so verbs like say. So there is a statistically significant difference between, let's say, New Shepherd doesn't want blah blah stick NPI and New Shepherd doesn't say blah blah stick NPI. And that's why we can say, okay, Czech has a class of negrazing verbs and Boskovic and Gajewski just make their heads. It's not true what they said. Uh, let me go through this, this, this. And now, the maybe more nuanced and interesting part of the experiment. So we, 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 we experimentally has shown that article in a nice journal uh, is not true. And uh, at least in Czech, there is something which was claimed to be non-existent. And uh, we have some, somehow nice negative story, but of course, no journal really will take just a negative story we have to come with our story about why this, this, uh, uh, this is so, but I will not uh, kill you with too much formal linguistics here, so I will just hint uh, at the end about this solution. But now to the, to the more interesting part of the, of the experiment. This is the inference task, so let me remind you, we ask people about uh, their intuitions about meaning. And uh, first we ask them, first we ask them, uh, whether the negrazing is uh, valid for them. So if they believe that John doesn't worry, John doesn't want uh, that Mary will leave tomorrow, if they believe that John wants Mary not to leave tomorrow and stuff like that. And that, again, we uh, uh, used uh, mixed model uh, to, to, uh, to look at this. And this condition, for condition one uh, was a success. So, uh, people have really strong inferences about these negrazing verbs. But condition two, so this cyclic negrazing and existential wide scope were really uh, judged by chance. So this was a failure of the experiment. So we expected that condition two and three would be the same as condition one, but it wasn't the case. So we found out that, that people are happy with the negrazing inference, they are happy with the uh, acceptability task, so there is an aggressive in check, but uh, it's uh, <coughs> harder for them uh, to process uh, two other conditions uh, which uh, uh, are somehow connected to inferences. And we, are, we, we were thinking with Jakub uh, why, this, uh, why this can happen. Uh, one reason, of course, is the higher complexity of condition two and three. When you look at the reaction times of condition two and three, against condition one, there was a big peak. So there was something like two or three times longer reaction time for these conditions uh, two and three. So really when you ask people about something like, if you believe that not every student thinks that Mary passed, would you believe that there are some students who think that Mary didn't pass? People maybe can get lost. Yeah. So that, that's nothing like a real explanation. But a real explanation uh, we figured out at the end was that we didn't control for the mood in the sentences, for the, for the embedding uh, of the sentences. Uh, I hope you remember from, from your grammar, grammar classes that there are two moods in, uh, well, Romance language, uh, uh, Slavic languages. In English, it's nearly lost today. Uh, but uh, in German there is. So, for instance, in Czech you can have either indicative mood in the embedded sentence, so something like I don't think and that, which is an indicative type of complementizer, or you can have something like nemyslím, že by, which is subjunctive embedding. And we didn't control for this in the, in the experiment. In fact, we used really mostly indicative. And that turns out to be a uh, uh, another factor which somehow interferes with the negrazing. And um, I don't want to go into detail, but then we, then we uh, made another experiment when we really looked at uh, <coughs> this subjunctive and we really asked 
again, something like 60 people, whether the subjunctive versus indicative makes a difference, and it turned out that this is the case. So the, the experiment was again on Ibex, the desi design was similar, and the result was uh, that uh, Subjunctive sentences were judged as better than indicative is the negrazing. So there was another factor which we didn't think about when we constructed the items for the first experiment because no literature ever uh, suggested that this can be interfering factor for negrazing. Nobody was thinking about negrazing in these terms. So uh, this was something new which comes as a uh, it's a problem in experiment one, and which tends to be an uh, interesting case in experiment two. And uh, now just uh, quickly to analyze it, because we are slowly running out of time, and I, I would be curious at uh, questions or comments. So uh, what, is, uh, what is the explanation? So now, now let's, let's go from the experimental linguistic back to the, to, to the formal linguistic. So, how people today explain this negrazing, not via some syntactic movement, but, some of, uh, but via some form of, of uh, 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 argument, let's say. So uh, don't look at the formulas. Uh, I will try to explain. So if I have a sentence like, John doesn't want Mary to leave, what people claim today is that when you have these verbs like want, uh, First, there is something which is called assertion. So the really uh, uh, truth conditional part of the meaning of the verb like want, which is something like if John wants something, then he wants it in all circumstances. And uh, logicians and philosophers call these all circumstances, all possible words, and that's why there is a, this universal quantifier or this universal quantifier from modology. Uh, but there is another part of the meaning for want, and this is called excluded middle implication. And it says that if uh, you want something, you cannot be indifferent. Either you want that, or you want the negation of that. So if you want, for instance, some weather fact, you either want that weather fact, or you want negation of that weather fact. And this excluded middle implication is according to people like Romoli, that's a dissertation from Harvard, uh, and Horn, which goes back to 70s, connected with this negrazing predicates. And when you put this implication uh, into the argument with the assertion, what you get is something like a run of the mill uh, logical argument where you end with the uh, negation, with the low scope. Uh, where you need it for these negrazers. Uh, mm, this is deductively valid, so let's, let's not uh, look at it in more detail, but let's, let's, uh, let's uh, substitute want with, let's say, uh, communication verb like say. For say, we don't have anything like excluded middle implication. For say, there is nothing like a, a law that you have to say either P or you have to say non-P. You can be silent, but for want, you really usually, or believe, you either believe P or you believe non-P, but not with communication or causation verbs. So for communication causation verbs, there is nothing like excluded middle implication, and because of that, the scope of negation remains high. And that's the theoretical explanation behind, uh, behind, the, uh, um, behind the experiment. And uh, here are some formulas uh, that you can compute how it proceeds. Again, we can go back to that in question time if you, if you are interested in that. Uh, what is, from our point of view, very, very interesting is how to deal with this subjunctive. Because this is something which is nice on experimental work. So the experiment reveals you something which people before that didn't notice or didn't uh, think about. And uh, no theory which is now on market uh, of negrazing. All these nice PhD theses from uh, Ivory League universities cannot deal with that. So now it's, it's a nice place of work 
how to somehow integrate uh, integrate this subjunctive, and we have some ideas about that. Uh, one uh, is connected to the fact uh, that when you uh, look at uh, subjunctive in, uh, for instance, Romance languages, when you want to deal with alternatives in the embedded verb, uh, in the embedded sentence, you have to use uh, subjunctive like uh, like here and non-indicative. So uh, if I go back, now it starts to be maybe a bit confusing. Uh, but when we, when we go here, these are somehow alterna alternatives which the negrazing verb has to work with in the embedding sentence. But if there is indicative, it works as sort of lock which doesn't allow the alternatives to be proceeds uh, with this degraser verb. And that, that why, that's the that's basic idea why, why, why indicative is sort of intervener in the languages where, where the subjective indicative uh, uh, difference is grammaticalized. Okay, so now to, let's go to something like a conclusion, skip many, many slides. So, in the bigger picture, what we see in modern linguistics is something like an oscillation between formal theories and one hand, and maybe modern linguistics is a bit different from other, at least natural sciences, because it started with the deductive part and the experimental approaches. And in the negrazing case, I really wanted to show you just that in form of two experiments that negrazing is more universal than previously claimed. So, for instance, it really exists in Slavic languages. And what we learn from Slavic languages is something which is important for general theories, that some factor, in this case subjunctive, but it can be any factor, is not easily describable by the common core uh, formal approaches. So there's something like an interplay between the experimental and theoretical part of, of the field, and everybody should be happy about that because that's how science should proceed, I think. And that's it. Thanks for listening to maybe too much linguistics.